The last time we were together, we were talking about a parable found in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 32. And it's a story which Jesus told to highlight the times and the nearness of time to his soon return. And it read like this, Learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. Even so, you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near right at the door. We spent some time unpacking this idea that there are certain events that will transpire in this world that give us an indication that Jesus is coming soon. We also acknowledged, of course, that Jesus is very clear only a few verses down when we get to verse 36, that no one knows the exact day or the hour. We must be weary of specific time setting or even soft time setting. We are warned off the ground of thinking we can pinpoint when Jesus is coming, but Jesus himself in the same breath says, you can know that it is near. And we spent some time in our previous visit together, unpacking the word of God, going all over scripture, and identifying signs in the political world, signs in the natural world, signs in the religious world. We looked at one of the great dangers that we face when we're uh, in terms of being unaware of these signs. And it's not that the signs are not there or imperceptible, but rather that we would be so busy and so caught up in living our everyday lives that we wouldn't be sober minded in spiritual things. We wouldn't be alert. We wouldn't be paying attention. Of course, that idea is captured right here in Matthew 24 as Jesus continues to talk, where he talks about how when he comes again, it will be like during the time of Noah, just before the flood, where people were simply eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, carrying on like normal, not paying attention to the message of the messenger Noah warning them of the end of all things and that they needed to get on board, get in the boat, get in the ark if they were to survive the coming destruction. And so I wanted to spend a bit of time digging a little deeper, not so much in terms of the chronology and the events and the signs, but all the signs lead up to a great event. All the signs lead up to the coming of Jesus. And so I want to divert away from the parable just for this this one time that we visit together so that we can consider what is that glorious day going to be like, right? If it's the climax of the ages, if it's the direction that the whole of history is headed towards, if you and I are supposed to be preparing for it, what is it going to be like? What can we expect? What does the Word of God say about it? Now, I guess I want to, I want to start by thinking of it as a great day of anticipation. You know, I've had the privilege of of, uh, of being a father to six children that have come into this world, one of which was a twin birth, so five births that my, my wife suffered through, right? And we anticipated every child's arrival like it was the only child on planet Earth, right? And if you're a parent, you might be able to relate to this. We prepare for it. We anticipate it. We, we, we desire that day to come. There's the growing of the belly. There's the, the ultrasounds and the doctor's appointments. There's, the, there's the, perhaps the reading of books and the asking of advice from various people. There's the preparing of the nursery and the child's room and the painting of the color of the room and the, and the buying of baby clothes and all those exciting things that herald the soon arrival of this child. And then eventually that day comes, the birth pangs come, and there's a lot of regret in those few hours, right? And then suddenly that child has come into the world and you hold that child for the first time. And all the pain of those few hours before and all the, and all the nervousness of the months before is forgotten as you hold this beautiful child in your arms. You know, the first child that was ever born into my family for my wife and I, I had, to be honest, not, I wasn't sure I actually wanted children. My wife was the one who persuaded me children would be a good idea. But when I held that first child for the first time, it's like, I can't describe it, this mysterious thing happened within me. And I remember, I remember my mother, the child's grandmother, right? This was the first grandchild born to my, to my mother. And I remember her pointing out in the hospital that day that, we, that, that, that it's like they had to pry this child out of my hands. It was such a glorious experience, such a wonderful experience. Finally, this child, my wife had known it was there from day one. She could feel the child inside of herself. But as a father, the arrival of that child was something extraordinary, something special, face to face with this child. 
Yes, I had talked to, to it through the belly of my wife. Yes, I had, I had uh, taken care of my wife in an effort to take care of the child. But to actually be reunited with that child, to actually be for the first time in its presence, it's it with me and in, in my presence together, we are we are there physically and tangibly. You know, I think that there's a little way in which we could compare that to the idea of the return of Jesus. We have had this, what we could call in some ways, a long distance relationship. We have learned to know him through his word. The presence of the Holy Spirit has made these things real to us down here. We have, we have grown in fellowship. We have grown to hear and to know his voice, the promptings of the Spirit upon our heart. We, we, we truly do know him. We know his character. We know his heart. He knows us. But you know... I think there's nothing that can substitute for that anticipated face to face with him. Above all else, what scripture reveals about the return of Jesus is the, is the thing we hope for, the thing we anticipate, the thing we long for and look forward to is the being face to face again. That was what the Garden of Eden was all about, going right back to the beginning. There was no separation between God and human beings. The separation was a consequence of sin. No longer could we be in the direct presence of God. We were something opposite to Him. We were incompatible. And so we were separated from Him actually as an act of mercy. The Bible says that God is a consuming fire for sin, right? And we as sinners having adopted that, we would have, we could not stand in his presence anymore. Yet he loved us, yet he wanted relationship with us. And so for a time, heaven and earth have been separated. We are, as it were, under quarantine. The pandemic of sin rages across this planet. The antidote has already been found in the blood of Jesus. And one day this world will be cured with the return of Jesus, the end of sin and sinners and all those who want nothing to do with him or his kingdom, who have not chosen relationship and fellowship with him. And in that day, we who desire him, we who have learned to know him, who follow his voice, the promptings of his spirit, who have surrendered to his grace, accepted the sacrifice of Jesus, we will be face to face reconciled with Jesus. The Bible calls this glorification when we will receive that gift of immortality, no longer these corruptible bodies subject to death, but the final capstone of the plan of salvation, having already received first the justifying grace, the forgiving grace of Jesus, having already experienced the renewing grace or the sanctifying grace of Jesus, the final touch of our salvation is that experience of glorification when Jesus will bestow upon us that gift of immortality and translate these, these subject to death, sickness, and suffering bodies into a glorious body like he received at the resurrection. You and I will be made like him, that we may be with him, that we may be face to face in his presence. This is the great goal of the plan of salvation. And this is the climax. This is what we look forward to about the coming of Jesus. But the Bible also tells us what it will be like. And it tells us that it will be a glorious sensory experience. Just like welcoming that little child into the world, holding it finally face to face, no more communicating through mum's belly, so too we will be face to face with our Lord. So let's take a few moments here. Let's read a few scriptural passages. Let's start, in fact, in Matthew 24. Uh, where, we, where we left off last time, where we focused last, last time with the story, with the parable of the fig tree. And we're going to go here to verse 42. It says in verse 42, Therefore be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. We've already clarified that, right? But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time the night of night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you be ready too, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. Jesus again highlights the necessity of constant, always preparation. We should be ready every day. Do not neglect any opportunity. Do not neglect any day. Do not take any day for granted or any time period for granted, especially when we're young and we feel bulletproof and we don't know sickness and 
achy, creaky, painful joints, and we don't know that the, the, we're not yet feeling the degradation in our body that old age is bringing. We can give our energy and our youth and our time to other things that that sparkle, other things that are the attractions of the world that seem to promise great reward. And we squander our youth and our time. We waste our opportunity. And so, as we begin to think about this glorious day, we're reminded here, as it were, with another parable with a parable of a home invasion. Jesus says, if you knew when the thief was coming, you would be there, you would be ready for him, and it wouldn't go well for the thief. Well, Jesus is saying, be ready for the coming of Jesus, because he's coming like a thief. Now, Jesus is not talking here about the nature of the coming. Some interpret this idea of Jesus coming as a thief in the night to be the idea of a secret rapture. Rapture is simply a word that indicates a, a, a being caught up together to meet him in the, in the air, right? And in fact, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, which we'll read in a moment, does speak about a rapture, that we will be caught up to meet him in the air. But it's not a secret rapture, right? The idea of a secret rapture is that Jesus will appear quietly, imperceptibly to the majority of the world, known only to his special people, and that when he does this, he will rapture them, extract them, take them to heaven with him, without the glorious appearing of the second coming, without all the angels, without all the sensory experience we're going to see pertaining to the second coming. Some people understand this idea of Jesus coming as a thief, that Jesus was saying, I'll come secretly in terms of the nature of the coming, not referring to the timing of the coming, and that I'll take my saints away and I'll leave behind on this world a group of people who will have a second chance There'll be a period of tribulation for seven years. An antichrist will appear during those times. And at the end of that, I will return to give those who were left behind an, a second opportunity to be saved. I believe that this is a misreading of the concept of thief in the night. And I believe that it's a misreading of the, of the concept of one will be taken and one will be left, which occurs only a few verses before um, here in Matthew chapter 24. So, after Jesus speaks about the coming of the Son of Man, verse 37, that will be just like the days of Noah. In those days, they were, before the flood, they were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. They did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So shall be the coming of the Son of Man. Then Jesus says this, There shall be two men in the field. One will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. And so people use this to say, you see, secret rapture. The very next verses, Jesus talks about a thief in the night. It must be talking about the nature of his coming. One will be taken and one will be left. But in order to understand this correctly, you must understand the, the, the metaphor that Jesus has used before this. As in the days of Noah, the flood came and took the wicked away. The ones who are taken away are not the saints who are raptured. The, the ones who are taken away are the wicked who are overcome by the final judgment. The ones who are left standing are, in fact, the faithful. They are standing at the coming of Jesus. This is the glorious appearing of Jesus. And at his coming, the Bible tells us, the wicked will be put to sleep and the righteous will be resurrected. And we who are alive at the coming of Jesus, along with those who have been resurrected, will together go up to meet the Lord in the air. The wicked have been taken away in judgment, and the righteous remain standing to welcome the return of the Lord. And then Jesus says, the time is urgent. You do not know when it's going to happen. It will be like a thief. It will catch you unaware if you are not paying attention. So the thief is not the nature of the coming, it's the timing of the coming. Let's look at what else Jesus says here. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 27, he says, For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, even so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Very clearly, Jesus is saying, there is nothing secret about my return. You are not going to have to realize that I've come because a whole bunch of people have gone missing and their clothes are left in a pile on the floor or jet airline pilots have been raptured and planes are falling out of the sky or, or drivers in cars are disappeared and there's, there's mayhem on the highways. This was the secret rapture. Jesus has come. No, the only time Jesus speaks about his return is in the context of the final 
judgment. It's in the context of final rewards. The problem with the idea of a secret rapture is it's a second chance doctrine. And if there is no second chance because the doctrine is wrong, many people are going to be caught unawares. You want to be ready for Jesus every day. You do not want to wait for some great event like a secret rapture. I don't believe that's even taught in Scripture. Jesus says, like the lightning that flashes from this side of the sky to that side of the sky, there will be no mistaking the coming of Jesus. The coming of Jesus, the only second coming of Jesus, will be glorious. It will be visible. It will be auditory. It will be felt bodily. There will be a resurrection of the saints. There will be uh, the laying to sleep of the wicked for a final judgment. There are all sorts of things happening at the coming of Jesus that are not at all secret. Jump with me for a moment to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and we'll read a little bit about this glorious day that Jesus highlights here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, one of my favorite, favorite passages. It says here, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another in the times of bereavement. Comfort one another in the times of persecution and discouragement, where you feel like life is overwhelming and, and it's not worth living anymore. Comfort one another with this truth that Jesus is coming again, glorious with all the heavenly angels, this idea that Jesus is coming with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. There's nothing secret about that. You know what that is? That's my alarm going off in the morning that wakes me from my deep sleep. That's what that is. The second coming is so, so glorious and so powerful that those who are dead in Christ, sleeping in their graves, are awakened by the alarm clock of God. There is nothing there is nothing hidden about this. There is nothing uncertain about this. You would not need to be told about this event. In fact, we're told explicitly in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 7, that every eye will see him. We're told that you will not need to be notified by the news broadcasters. You will not need to guess because a bunch of people disappeared off of the face of the earth. You will not need to be uh, um, you know, rung by your neighbor to say, Jesus has come. It says here, let me read it to you straight out of the Word of God. Uh, Revelation 1 verse 7, Behold, He is coming with the clouds. And those clouds, by the way, those clouds are not a reference to water vapor in the heavens. It's an allusion to the Old Testament. It's the clouds of angels. It's this idea that heaven is left empty when Jesus, when God the Father, when the angels come to this earth to receive those who are His own. It's this idea that Jesus arrives with a retinue, with a grand entrance, like a king would in the old days, with his whole court coming with him. It's this picture King of kings and Lord of lords with the entire heavenly army coming with him. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who, are, who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. Even so, amen, which means the word amen means let it be so, so be it. Even so, even though it means destruction to this world, even though there's a class of people who are not happy at His coming, who are ultimately put to sleep awaiting their final judgment, even so, let it be so. The coming of Jesus divides this world, or at least makes manifest the division of this world into two classes of people. Those who have wanted reconciliation with God, those who have sought relationship with Jesus, those who are in communion with Him, though they have slept in the dust of the earth, they are resurrected to meet Him. It is reunion morning. It is resurrection morning. It is the greatest day of their lives. It is what they have anticipated for. It is what they have sacrificed for. It is what they have been committed to, that what they have, to whom they have given their allegiance. He has come. It's the day of reward. And then there's another class of people. And this class of people are not happy. Why? Because the coming of Jesus brings an end to their dreams, brings an end to their aspirations. Their hopes are pinned on this world. The investment of their time and their resource, their talent and their energy has been in building their kingdom down here. And now this Jesus comes and decimates it. 
He is not the hope, the anticipation of everything they've looked forward to. He is the end of everything they've hoped for. They flee for the hills, they run for their lives, they try and hide themselves, but they cannot escape the one who sits upon the throne. For one group of people, Jesus is their glorious hope. For another group of people, Jesus is a terrible interruption. For one group of people, Jesus is life and resurrection. For another group of people, Jesus is death and sleeping in the grave, judgment. For these two groups of people, it is the same event at the same moment of time with the same Jesus on the same throne of heaven. But there are two different experiences of this one great event. And what is the difference? What makes the difference between how you will one day experience this event? The choice you make today. The allegiance and the orientation of your heart. Which way does it go? Towards Jesus Christ or away from Jesus Christ? You see, one Jesus, one event, one glorious appearing to one group of people, it is a positive thing, life eternal. To others, it is a neg negative thing, death eternal. And the difference between how you experience it, your choices today, whom you align with today. You see, the thing about the coming of Jesus is not only is it the end of sin and sinners and the destruction of this world, the end of this sinful age, but the thing about the coming of Jesus is it is face to face with Him. It is me holding my baby for the first time, right? It's that glorious anticipation finally fulfilled. It is life and health and immortality. No more suffering, no more death. I mean, have a look here. Have a look here at what Philippians chapter 3 says. At the end, it says the following, Philippians 3 verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things to Himself. This idea that when Jesus comes, we're going to receive our new bodies. We're going to be made like Him, immortal, no longer subject to the pain and the suffering and, the, and ultimately the death that sin brings, the wages of sin. We will be bodily freed from the habitation of sin. Our natures completely reworked so that we are like Adam and Eve before the fall. Hey, think about this. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, do you realize that it was an unnatural thing for them to do? See, sin for you and me, it's kind of natural. It's what we gravitate towards. It's why when we accept Jesus, there is this lifetime of struggle because we have the new nature of Christ growing within us, uh, fighting against this warped nature deformed by sin. There is this constant struggle. But for Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, the first time they chose sin, they had to go against the good and holy nature that they were created with. God gave that to them as a gift. Why wouldn't He? He designed them in His image to live in harmony with Him. So with their first sin went against their nature. Now living righteously goes against our nature. But guess what? At the coming of Jesus, you guessed it, not only is our physical body renewed, but spiritually speaking, morally, we are reoriented so that by nature we do what is right and sin will be this foreign thing. What a glorious gift that is. What an incredible opportunity we have. Who wouldn't want that? These are, th this is what the coming of Jesus means to us. This is why Jesus says, be alert, be vigilant, like that fig tree sprouting the first leaves that tell you that spring is coming. We are near that time, friend. We are coming up on that glorious day. So don't lose heart. Don't be discouraged. Don't give up prematurely. Cross the finish line. Endure to the end. Another great passage that we find describing the coming of Jesus is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And here we find something very similar to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, to be honest. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it reads like this, talking about the coming of Jesus. 
It says here in verse 50, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable must put on imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. You know, this is the glorious promise that <clears throat> on the one hand, there will still be a group of faithful alive at the coming of Jesus, despite all the attempts of the enemy, all the attempts of Satan working through human agencies to persecute, to destroy, to eradicate this world of the church of God, of the truth of God. The promise in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is that the enemy will fail. We will endure. The church of God will go through. The, the, the faithful of God will, will be strengthened by God. And there will be a generation alive at the coming of Jesus. But if you are not amongst that generation, if you know in your body right now that something's not right, you have that medical diagnosis, you're getting a little long in the tooth, you realize that, that, that the end for you is coming sooner rather than later, you do not need to fear because there is the promise of the resurrection. The graves of everyone who die in faithfulness to Christ are marked by heaven as belonging to Christ. The cross, the X, marks the spot, as we say. And that grave will be broken open at the return of Jesus, and you will come out with all your memories, with all your history, with all your relationships intact, to be face to face with Jesus. The biggest thing about the coming of Jesus is not only that it'll be audible, not only that it'll be visual and, 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 and tangible and felt in our bodies. It is the face to face with Jesus. It is the relationship component that I look forward to the most. No more long distance. Now face to face with Jesus. And there's an added bonus because as we've read in these passages, not only are we face to face with Jesus, but our lost loved ones. The ones who are now sleeping in the grave, those broken relationships that have brought pain to our heart in this life. If you have been faithful to Jesus and they have been faithful to Jesus, if, if you've lived in, in the spirit of trusting in what Christ has done, then the glorious news of the coming of Jesus is not only face to face with Jesus as the pinnacle of everything, but reunion mourning with your loved ones, your friends and your family that you have said good night to. We'll see you in the morning. It's that beautiful promise of resurrection. Reunion morning. And that's why this is such a fitting parable that Jesus tells. In Matthew 24 and in Luke 21. This idea that you can tell that spring is coming because the fig tree's blossoms arrive. Before you felt it. Before your body has warmed up to it. Before the cold winds have stopped blowing. Before the days have gotten nice and long, you know it's coming because there is the sign of the resurrection. You know what? The resurrection of Jesus is our assurance. The resurrection of Jesus was that first fruit experience, that budding of the, of the, uh, of the fig tree. It is the assurance that you and I have that if he was resurrected, that means that the sacrifice he made was 100% acceptable and complete. And if we trust in it, his resurrection will be our resurrection. Just like right now, his life is our life. In that day, his resurrection will be our resurrection. You see, you and I have this thing to look forward to. We have this assurance, this guarantee of the return of Jesus and with it, all the blessings of heaven, face to face with Jesus and face to face with our loved ones. You do not want to be unprepared for that day. You want to be spending time, a thoughtful hour each day, thinking about spiritual things, communing with God, so that as you live in this world, you live as a stranger, as an alien, because indeed you are a citizen of the heavenly kingdom. Heaven belongs to you, friend. It has been purchased by the blood of Jesus. And the longing of the Father in heaven is to be with you face to face again. 
This is the direction of history. This is the trajectory of this world. It has always been from the very beginning about you in the presence of God, created in the image of God, that you may receive all the glory of what God is in friendship, in union, in relationship. Sin has taken us on a detour. Sin has gotten in the way. But while human beings through our choices are quite capable of delaying the purposes of God, we are incapable of derailing the purposes of God. We may choose the circuitous route, the scenic route, but we will ultimately arrive in the destination that God has planned. Why? Because it's His universe. Because we are His creation. Because we are the ones He has redeemed. His purpose will stand fast he will have a race of beings, human beings, to live in His presence forever. Your choice is whether you'll be one of them. That's what you get to decide. But the plans of God are sure. His sacrifice is complete. Salvation is assured. The end of sin is guaranteed. And Jesus' return is beyond a doubt. The question for you today again, do you want to be a part of it? Are you going to be ready on that day? Because the way you prepare for face-to-face -face that day is learning to know and love Him this day. That is the preparation for tomorrow. Being faithful today to the Jesus who has laid down His life for you. So I'm going to ask you one more time. Do you want to be in that number? Jesus' plans, they will succeed. They are a guaranteed foregone conclusion. He has made sure of that. And because of that, you and I have assurance. Do you want it? It's yours for the taking. Jesus is yours for the having. Because He has already given Himself to this world. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever would believe in Him would not perish, but would have eternal life life. It's yours for the taking. Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, I just thank you that you, in a world of uncertainty, have given us certainty. In a world of disappointment, you've given us glorious anticipation. In a world that wobbles and shakes, you have given us stability. In a world that is hard to see sometimes where we are going. You, through your word, have given us the final destination. And above all these things, you've assured us of your good, kind, and gracious intent for us. And I pray for the person hearing this message right now, Lord. I pray that the hope of your soon return will take hold upon their heart, that they will realize the guarantee in this, and that they will choose to welcome you and your friendship today. So please, Jesus, teach us to walk with you. Teach us to be faithful with you. Teach us, Lord, to trust in you. Help us not to worry about the things to come upon this world, but simply to focus upon our daily journey with you. And be our strength and our shield, we pray, when we need it most. In Jesus' name.